So scary times we're in a bit with our third war theater with the attack on Libya, the hope that Muammar Gaddafi will stop killing his own people and some sanity can be restored to that uh, part of the world. And with uh, the ongoing problems they're having in Japan and, you know, we're just getting into the spring flooding season and there's a lot of stuff going on. And this will be the time when a lot of people will turn to the Bible for solace. Uh, They'll find their favorite passages. They'll contemplate God, perhaps like last week in our conversation on Coast to Coast. Um, They'll find a greater amount of peace uh, by, by prayer and by meditation, regardless of whatever church, denomination, religion, whatever it is that they pursue. But would they feel the same way if those favorite passages of theirs had been forged before they were included in the Bible? That's the area of this new book from biblical scholar Bart Ehrman. We'll talk about forged, um, just what is in the Bible um, that Bart Ehrman claims is 100% completely forged. It's controversial. It may even be explosive for some. You'll hear about it next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Ponnet. Uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, the professor Bart Ehrman, who we've had on many times on Coast to Coast, was on my brain earlier this week on Coast to Coast, uh, before we're thinking about Coast to Coast for this weekend. Good evening, Bart. Hey, how you doing? Good. Nice to have you back again. Thanks. Uh, um, I was thinking about you because we had a guest on last week on Coast to Coast, a Dr. Newberg, Andrew Newberg, who wrote a book called um, the, uh, the, How God Affects the Brain. And it, it, he he he's a radiologist and he's a, a neuroscientist, neuro researcher, and he he's at the University of Pennsylvania. And he did something like five thousand scans of people who are thinking about God, and they would do a scan before and then a scan after when they showed that, especially over prolonged periods of time, the brain develops new neural pathways. Um, it reduces stress levels that prayers and meditations about God, even amongst atheists and agnostics, um, create a greater sense of well-being and reduce stress hormones, which can uh, lead to uh, disease and early death. And I thought that's such an interesting relationship to the uh, to to religion. And I know that at one time you had been a, um, you know, a conservative evangelical Christian until you started to study the classic languages and Semitic languages of the of the Bible. And, and you started to look deeper into the texts. And, and then you came to a place where you consider yourself agnostic to this still. Yeah, part? that's right. Agnostic. Okay. Yeah. And he said that even agnostics who are thinking about God still get the same benefit from uh from from this uh, from these neural pathways that only people that don't do any thinking about it ever, even atheists who just think about their image of God, show a benefit in their brain, which I think is interesting. I, I, I thought I saw it, I made me think of you because I was both finishing his book and reading yours at the same time. Yeah, well, then uh, I guess I'm in good shape. Because you are. As an agnostic, I think about God all the time. <laughs> right. I, there's, I think you've got to be the, the number one God-thinking agnostic in the country. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I probably am. <laughs> so your, your brain, the effect on your brain didn't change at all from when you switched from being an evangelical Christian, a professor, to an agnostic. Yeah, uh, probably not. Still got the same brain. Yep. But the, and who knows? It might have improved it. Maybe that's why you can write so many books. Uh, <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the new book is so interesting. And, and you make the point at the beginning that for, again, once more, for a lot of biblical scholars— the the concepts of this book are not new, but for the layperson, much of this material may also not only be new, but it might be shocking and even maddening um, because people don't like to use the F word when it comes to the Bible. Well, that's right. And, you know, I mean, one of the I think one of the differences from my other books that are for popular audiences is that um, this book, well, for one thing, I mean, this book is based on on uh, more original research. Uh, it's not just popularizing things that other scholars have said, but but the other thing is that the, that scholars too are reluctant to say that that parts of the Bible are forged, even though um, if you listen to what they're saying, that actually is what they're saying. It's just they they don't like to use the F word either. 
And and the reason why they don't, they pull it right up to the edge of saying forged. Then really, instead of using forged, they, they use, you know, $10 words with lots of syllables in them. Yeah, right. So what you do is instead of saying that a book is forged, you say that it's a, a pseudepigraphon, <laughs> right? <laughs> which uh, sounds sophisticated and technical. But uh, and scholars all the time will talk about pseudepigraphy and pseudepigrapha. But uh, what, I mean, what a pseudepigraphon is, the literal meaning of the word pseudepigraphon, which they don't tell you, is uh, it's a writing that is inscribed with a lie. <laughs> so it's you know it's it's as bad as forged. It just uh, it does people don't know what it means, and so uh, it's okay to use it. it. In this case, in the book Forged, you focus mostly on the on the New Testament. There's some references to the Hebrew Scriptures, but um, uh, the, the bulk of this is on those books that are uh, more recent. Um, why not more of the books of what the of the Christian Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible? Why not why not focus on those and the the names that are commonly associated as the authors of those books? Right. Well, yeah, one could do that. I mean, I mean, and it's important to understand what I mean by the by the term forge, which of course, you, of course, you know, but maybe some uh, listeners don't. Uh, when when I use the word forge, I'm I'm talking about somebody who wrote a book and claimed to be a famous person, even though they were someone else. And so uh, in the New Testament, you have letters that claim to be written by Paul, which almost certainly were not written by Paul, written by somebody who said he was Paul. And so you do get that phenomenon somewhat in the Old Old Testament in a, in a few places. I mean, for example, the book of Ecclesiastes claims to be written by King Solomon, uh, but in, but scholars are sure that Solomon didn't write it. It was written hundreds of hundreds of years, many hundreds of years after Solomon was dead, by somebody claiming to be Solomon. Uh, and so you get it there. You get it in the book of Daniel, which is claiming to be written by a prophet living uh, in the sixth century BCE, when in fact it was written about four hundred years later. So. You do get the phenomenon some in the Old Testament, but the problem with the Old Testament is that most of the books don't um, – the authors themselves don't claim – don't make any claims about themselves. So, for example, the book of Genesis doesn't claim to be written by Moses, so that when later people said it was written by Moses, uh, it wasn't the author's fault. Right. And so I'm talking about books where the author is actually making a claim for himself. And it goes out of his way to to put data – in the book to try to bolster the case that it was written by this famous person. Well, that's right. I mean, this is a this was a common technique of forgers in the ancient world, and it's still used by forgers today. You you want your reader to think that you're the person you say you are, and so if you um, if you're claiming to be Peter, for example, you, and you're writing a book, uh, you, you know, Peter is Jesus' disciple. Well, then you you know you tell stories about how you and Jesus did things together, or uh, you experienced things in Jesus' life, and that way your reader thinks that you really know what you're talking about and that you must be the person you claim to be. Uh, and this is more common uh, in the, the New Testament. This is sort of unique to the New Testament um, that, that they don't have. In the, they don't give, there's not a lot of, there aren't any examples in the Old Testament Scripture where they are going out of their way to claim to be somewhere or to claim to be doing something. Well, the only two examples out of the entire Old Testament are the two books I mentioned, Ecclesiastes and Daniel. Most most of the other books are either anonymous, so that the author didn't say who they were, or, you know, they're written by, or they're related to people who probably had something to do with it, like the book of Amos. You know, I mean, whoever, we don't know who Amos was, but, uh, you know, the, the author isn't trying to make you think that he's some famous person that he wasn't. In this case... It may not have been written, actually physically written by Amos, but these are, could have been the oral traditions that were passed down. Amos kept saying these things. Amos kept saying them, and other people kept repeating what Amos said until somebody finally put pen to paper. Yeah, that's right. And and so the author isn't uh, isn't trying to convince you, you know, that he's somebody famous. It's just somebody. I mean, probably some guy named Amos who was a prophet, and and uh, later later some of his teachings were put down into this book. But the actual writer is echoing Amos. So there's, a, there's an attempt at sort of like how, you know, my great-grandfather would have told a story that keeps getting passed down. And if I claimed the authorship of that story, that would actually be 
that would be kind of a forgery. If I claimed it to that I wrote it, it wouldn't be if it was an oral you know, history that was passed down and repeated the exact same way, and then I finally wrote it down. I really should put my grandfather's, my great grandfather's name to it because it's really his story, not mine. Well, yeah, it gets a little bit, you know, there, there's a lot of gray area. And so the thing is, if you had a famous grandfather and uh, suppose you, you wanted to uh, convey some message that was your message, but you, but you were nobody, but your grandfather was somebody, and you wrote a book and claimed to be your grandfather, that would be a forgery because you'd be claiming to be somebody you weren't. Uh, it's a little bit different if if your grandfather uh, actually taught, you know, left some notes or something behind and, and you published those claiming to be your grandfather. Well, you know, that, that's a little bit different from writing your own book claiming to be your grandfather. But claiming to be, I would just, and this is why I'm making this point, we're talking with Bart Ehrman about the book Forged. We'll get into more specifics about the New Testament scripture here in just a second. But, but claiming to be and saying the story is by are two different things to me. So the reason why I say Amos, you mentioned the prophet Amos, if, if, I, if I'm the one who's actually writing down exactly what was said by Amos or as it was repeated for two generations and then finally I put it down on paper, I'm going to put down Amos. Amos said this. These are Amos's words. I'm just collecting them in a different form. And I yeah, think that's, that's right. different than uh, saying uh, that, I'm Amos. That, yeah, that's right. And that, that is different from writing your own prophecies and claiming to be Amos. Right. Because yeah. that's really what we start to see more of in the New Testament, as you claim, in the book Forge. And I think every most scholars would agree with you um, to what degree that may be a matter of debate, but that there are books, in the, in the particularly in the Christian uh, part of the Bible, where the focus is on taking the name of somebody who had uh, the reputation and the authority— and attaching it to a personal agenda that had nothing to do with the original person. Yeah, or, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, it either had nothing to do with it or it, it ended up being an irrelevant thing. I mean, if you claim to be Peter, and it turns out you're talking about something that Peter might have talked about, I mean, the thing is you have no way of knowing because, you right. know, you're living 40 years later or something, and you just, you've got a message, and you, you want people to read your message, and so you, you say that you, you are Peter. And so this is not, as you said, this is really not controversial among most scholars, the idea that the many of the writings of, say, Peter or Paul are not actually the writings of Peter and Paul, and in fact, may be contrary to what Peter or Paul would have said in their lifetime. Right. So there, there, there's very little debate among scholars about a book like Second Peter in the New Testament, which claims to be written by Peter. He, the author says he was there to see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he was one of Jesus' companions. And uh, but, but scholars are are quite unified that whoever wrote Second Peter, it wasn't Peter. So uh, that you know, for scholars, that's not controversial. I think for for people who don't know the scholarship, it sounds like a, a, a fairly bold claim. What scholars are reluctant to do is to call that a forgery, and that's what I'm trying to do in my book, is to show that, in fact, that is what it is. It's a forgery. And the claim is, and this is what I went, when I went through seminary, I went, I heard this said a lot, is that this was a common technique, um, and that this was sort of like what they would have done in ancient Greece or Rome, where the author was writing in the school of somebody yes. famous, and so it's not. It does. It, it's not fair to call it a forgery because, by that standard, uh, it really wasn't. It, there was nothing wrong about it at the time. Right. That's what I learned in seminary too. And one of the things I try to show in my book is that 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 view is precisely wrong. Uh, that in fact we don't have evidence that this was uh, widely practiced. Or I mean, it, uh, I mean I have to be clear about it. It was widely practiced, uh, but it wasn't widely practiced and approved. Uh, in other words, there are a lot of things that, that happen a lot that are not widely approved. I mean, people cheat on their taxes all the time, but it doesn't mean that there's social approval of it. Or you know, people uh, people have affairs and commit adultery all the time, but it doesn't mean that it's socially approved. And forgery is like that. It happened a lot, but it was wasn't socially approved, and we don't have any evidence, or we have very, very, very little evidence that this happened in the philosophical schools and was an acceptable practice. Uh, it may have happened, but it wasn't acceptable. And and there are examples of people who were either exposed as a forger or 
they were um, maybe even in in a lighter sense of the word prosecuted for being a, a forger. But but then there were also examples we can we can know or we or know for sure that there was a profit motive. Even before the Bible had been codified as we know it today, there was a profit motive for faking books of the Bible. Uh, yeah, so yeah, profit is a good good term for this. So uh, that you know, in the ancient in the ancient Greek and Roman worlds, you have a lot of instances of forgery, which is one of the things I talk about in the book. And and forgers would sometimes in antiquity uh, claim to be a famous author so that they could, get, they could get paid for their book. And so, if a library, for example, is collecting the writings of Plato uh, and is willing to pay gold for them, uh, then you know, a lot of treatises of Plato will start showing up because, you know, people can make money off of it. And so that's, that's one of the commonly, uh, the widely attested uh, motives for forgery in the ancient world. And one question I deal with in the book is whether that motive actually applies to the Christian stuff, because when libraries are collecting the writings of Plato, they're not collecting the writings of Paul, <laughs> because right. Paul, of course, is not a famous author in the ancient world. He's just this Christian who had these these ideas. And so so there's a there's a genuine question about whether Christian forgers were actually doing it for the money or if they had other other reasons for doing what they did. Well, I think I mean if to go down that line of thinking, I think it's it's easy to assume that if the people of the first and second century of the you know, since Christ have were exactly the same type of people that we are today, and I think we are. I don't think we've changed much. That if they had the same motives, if they were the wired the same way that we're wired today, then a lot of people might have forged um, their letters and ascribed them to Paul in order to win an argument. Yeah, I think that's. I think that is the primary motive among the early Christians. Um, I talk about maybe, I don't know, eight or nine, ten different motives widely in the Greek and Roman worlds, but this is it for the Christians. Uh, you, you, you're living in a situation 20 or 30 years after Paul, and you have a point of view that is controversial, and uh you know, you don't you don't have any authority, but because uh, no, no, you know, you're a nobody. But you write up your view, and you write a letter embracing your point of view. And in order to get people to accept your point of view, you claim to be Paul, uh, because people pay attention to Paul. And so it's in order to, as you say, it's in order mainly to win your argument. Yeah, and and to win your argument, and to try to influence people, and perhaps even on the other side of that, maybe to raise your profile, even if you aren't the person that um, that is doing the writing, if you're the person who did the finding of that text or you're the person who's a local, you've been making this argument locally and suddenly a text shows up that bolsters your case, that makes you sound like you are the smart person who got it all along, well, then you do in the end perhaps enjoy a cash benefit uh, or just kind of the through the back door. Well, that's right. And, you know, the... Um you know, I mean, it actually comes down to very important issues. I mean, you have there there are letters of Paul in the New Testament that uh, that indicate that women are not allowed to participate in the uh, actively in the church. They're not to speak. They're not to teach. They're not to exercise authority. Well, these books actually were not written by Paul. Uh, they're written by somebody later claiming to be Paul who had that point of view. Uh, and in order to make sure the women were silent, uh, the author of First Timothy, claiming to be Paul, tell, in Paul's name, says that women have to, can't exercise any authority. So, so th- this is actually an important. Uh, it's an important aspect of early Christianity that these books, uh, some some of these books, uh, like First Timothy, are actually not by Paul, but they're they're forged and they represent a point of view that Paul didn't have. I think that's the, again, whenever you say the F word, that's going to be very uncomfortable for a lot of people because the idea that the Bible contains forgeries, even if they were well-intended forgeries, even if that's going to, that's going to, obviously that that's going to create some ripple effects when we get to the phone calls coming up later on this evening. And I'm all for taking the calls. I I think you're making a, a fair claim. Why use a fancy academic term for it? When we have a modern word that's much simple, much more simple, if only because it also has much more impact. The word is forged. Bart Ehrman's new book out about which books of the Bible 
are forged. We'll get into a little bit more of this too. When we talk about Revelation, you can't help but talk about the apocalypse these days with predictions that are coming in uh, in May and then maybe 2012 for other people uh, about the book of Revelation. So we'll talk about whether or not that is a forgery or to degree that that is a forgery on the way. And then even if they are forgeries, can they contain truth? Coming up next on Coast to Coast, this is Ian Ponnet. The book is Forged, Bart Ehrman's new book. He's got a series of them, and we've interviewed him over the years. Uh, this is the book, though, that may make the biggest claim, or at least the one that uh, that some people get to find uh, very challenging. The untold story of forgeries in the Bible next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Ponnet. Uh so we were, I just mentioned before the bottom of the hour that we would get to the book of Revelation coming up. I'm just reminded of that because every day when I drive home now, I drive past signs that say uh, Christ is returning May 21st, 2011. And it, there are a lot of people who are buying into this, obviously, some people who are investing in it or they wouldn't be able to put up, afford to put up billboards everywhere. Um, and and so that brings us, in some cases, back to the book of Revelation, as a lot of people expect that there would be end times in their lifetime. And that's kind of a theme that runs through um, Forged uh, by Bart Ehrman, uh, writing in the name of God, one of the subtitles for the book, because there was there was both another apocalypse that almost made it into the Bible, which was considered to be forged, and a lot of people consider the apocalypse of John, the one that did make it into the Bible, to be forged. Right. So um, the the book of Revelation is an interesting example uh, because the author claims to be somebody named John. Uh, and so people call it the apocalypse of John or the revelation of John. And uh, my, my, my own view of this is that somebody named John actually wrote the book. Uh, but he's not John, the disciple of Jesus. Uh, this, again, is not a particularly revolutionary claim. This is something that scholars have, have argued for, actually, for many, many centuries. Scholars have known that whoever wrote this wasn't the same person who wrote the Gospel of John, for example. But, uh, but people today tend to think that this, in fact, is written by the disciple of Jesus, John, and, and they're wrong about that. This, this is a case where, uh, that, uh, of a phenomenon that's a little bit different that, uh, that I actually I call homonymy, <laughs> which is a word that people don't know and, uh, because nobody uses it. Uh, but it, it means uh, written by somebody with the same name as a famous person. And so that's the deal with the book of Revelation, is that there was a famous person named John, John the son of Zebedee, but he almost certainly certainly is not the person who wrote who wrote this book. Well, I think what's important to mention then too is then does it lose its value as an apocalypse as well, as a prediction, yeah. right? And at the time there were a lot of people that that were looking at whether they included the apocalypse of John or the apocalypse of Peter or both and they looked at apocalypse of John with a jaundiced eye. It almost it, it's really one of the books that almost didn't make it into the Bible. That's absolutely right. Into the 4th century, we have church fathers arguing about whether to accept the Apocalypse of John, and there were, there were church fathers who uh, were adamant that, in fact, it should not belong in the New Testament. Uh, it, was, it was the last book uh, to, be, to be widely accepted as part of the New Testament, and the, the argument hinged on who wrote the thing. And uh, finally, church fathers concluded that John, the son of Zebedee, wrote it. This is hundreds of years later. They, they didn't have any way, really, of knowing who wrote it. But they, they thought that John, the son of Zebedee, had written it, and he was one of the disciples, and so they included it. Well, they were wrong about that, uh, because John, the son of Zebedee, did not write it. And so that, that creates, I think, a theological problem for a lot of Christians. If, if the Bible contains books that were accepted on false premises, what does that do? I mean, does it mean that, that the book should no longer be accepted as part of the Scriptures or not? So, I, you know, I don't get into that question uh, in the book, and because it, I'm not... I'm not arguing we should throw books out of the New Testament, but I do think that the author issue is important to recognize that, that here we have a book that was accepted as part of the New Testament because people thought it was written by somebody who, in fact, did not write it. Well, and I think it's a fair thing, though, that, in effect, you you, tu- you touch on it, on the idea of w- which books are in and which ones are out on what, on what basis. You can't help but wonder, then, 
you know, how much stake have people put into the book of Revelation that a book which was which was you could you could make an argument for was forged, although, as you say, more likely honestly written by a guy named John. And he never himself makes the claim. He never himself makes false claims. Yeah, that's 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 what I argue in the book is that he, the author doesn't doesn't claim to be a famous person. It's only people living much later who said he was a famous person, and so that's a different thing. Um, yeah, that, that's a different thing. And you know, you mentioned this other apocalypse, the apocalypse of Peter. That that's a book that almost did make it into the New Testament. There were people in the into the fourth fifth century who thought it was part of the New Testament, and it is a forgery. Uh, it claims to be written by Peter, and in fact, it was not. Okay, so th- good. That means then, doesn't it, that that a lot of the church fathers were attuned to the idea of what was and what wasn't a forgery. It wasn't like they would let in anything. They were trying to discriminate, weren't they, between what they could prove to be forgeries for what they had on, you know, at their hands at the time, and you know what they were willing to accept as being valid. That's right. The, uh, the this sounds like you, you know it may sound like this is something that scholars are doing today, but they they've just invented this entire uh, this way of proceeding. But in fact, in in early Christianity, this is one of the things the church fathers argued about: is is the book of First Peter written by Peter or not? Uh, and you know, and some said yes, some said no. And uh, but they this was a topic of conversation because they obviously did not want to include books. In in the New Testament that were that were forgeries. So, so to their credit, I mean they were they they were conscientious about it. It wasn't like some people have claimed and there's a lot of people that will talk sort of make up stories about how the Bible was thrown together somewhat willy-nilly and and that that effect wasn't the case, but it still doesn't mean that they didn't get a couple of curveballs passed, you know, the, uh, the into the batter's box, right? I mean there's a couple and and we know that from as you mentioned Paul that of the majority of the things that are ascribed uh, to Paul were not written by Paul. Very, I'm almost Im- impossible for what's well, maybe six of the thirteen were not written by Paul, or seven that's, of the thirteen. Yeah, that's yeah. Six, so there are thirteen letters that claim to be written by Paul, and scholars scholars are pretty sure that seven of them really were written by Paul, and so those are called the undisputed Pauline epistles. And the other six, uh, there are some debates about a few of them, but most scholars think Paul didn't write them. And in the early church, there were there were, they had a lot more books that claimed to be written by Paul that were judged by the church fathers to be forged. But the problem was that the, one of the ways the church fathers made this kind of decision wasn't wasn't on the basis of some kind of careful linguistic analysis like modern scholars use. Often it was because uh, church fathers didn't like the theology of a book. Uh, they thought that it, it stated uh, it, well, it stated views that they didn't agree with, and so they said, "Well, Paul obviously didn't write this because it has false views." But they they judged what a false view was in light of what they themselves happened to believe. Well, uh, but in a way, I mean, what else did they have? I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, they were. That's really. I mean, they could, if they were trying to do it, that may have been all that they had. Was just does this seem consistent with the Paul that we know? Um, and their their idea that Paul wouldn't have ever had a contradictory idea. I mean, I think it's the same criteria we're using now. We look at First Timothy, where Paul talk, talks down the role of women, but in other places in the Bible, Paul talks up. Uh, deaconesses and other people that were central to the uh, evangelism of uh, of Jesus. Well, that that's right. That's how we know that uh, that these six letters that uh, are disputed. That's how we know that Paul probably didn't write them is because they they do stand at odds with what Paul himself says somewhere else. And the church fathers were, of course, you're right. I mean, they they uh, they. It was completely legitimate for them to to use that kind of criterion. It's just that they didn't have the kinds of uh, analytical tools that we have available to us today to make a make a definitive decision. And if they had a book that seemed to contradict their own points of view, then they concluded, well, an apostle could not have possibly written this. Now, the problem with this, and for people that think, okay, well, this is just you know a bunch of theologians talking about the number of angels that can dance on the head of a pin. There are some real life consequences for these forgeries or for at least uh, 
for the validity that's given to some of these scriptures that doesn't that that are falsely attributed to a an apostle or somebody famous uh, and that when you when you elevate the writing of some person we don't know who it is to be the same as being a follower, like a direct follower, somebody that was in the presence of Jesus, then that elevates whatever it is that they claim in the writing to be truer than just some other schmo on the street. And that leads us to what I think we can say some fairly dire consequences um, for Jews over the years, is that some of these documents uh, that are in the Bible that are falsely attributed to somebody like a disciple— uh, it, it lead directly to the persecution and death of millions of Jews over the years. That's right. Uh, this, this really does have serious consequences. So, uh, you know, an example of that sort of thing is that in the, in the Gospels of the New Testament, um, you come to the Gospel of John, which is the last of the Gospels to be written, and it, it does say some very nasty things about the Jews. I mean, in John chapter 8, um, Jesus says that uh, Jews are the children of the devil, as opposed to being the children of, of God. And obviously, somebody later reading that takes it quite seriously and and uh, and casts aspersions on Jews. And it's thought in that's because, you know, John is thought to be an inspired book. Now, now the, the Gospel of John is, is not what I would call a forgery, because the author doesn't claim to be John. It's written anonymously. But later people Later, people took this anonymous book and said it was written by Jesus' own disciple who was there to hear these things being said. In fact, it wasn't written by somebody there who heard these things said. It was written by somebody living uh, several decades later in a different country, speaking a different language, who's recording traditions that he's heard about Jesus. But there are all sorts of reasons for thinking that these uh, traditions he's heard about Jesus are not historically accurate. And so— I think that's really the, the key claim that, again, just to point out what you're saying about forged, is that they are falsely attributed, as I was making the point to say, to somebody famous, and that, that even that itself has consequences. Or you look at the number of women who were prevented from church leadership over the, the millennia uh, just because, on the basis of, of First Timothy that wasn't really written by Paul, and that if Paul were alive today, he would see the line in there about how women should be silent in church, and he might have been absolutely aghast at that, but there was nothing he could do about it. Well, that's right, because in, in Paul's Paul's own letter, First Corinthians, uh, in chapter, uh, I mean, in chapter eleven, he talks about. I mean, women do speak in church, and he approves of it. They can pre, they can prophesy uh, in church, and uh, so that's okay. Uh, but and it's more than okay. I mean, it was part of Paul's churches. But then somebody later writes a book claiming to be Paul, in which he silences women. And this is, we still live with this today. And the Catholic Church, of course, there can't be women priests. Well, it's largely because of this passage in First Timothy. Uh, or in a lot of Protestant churches, women can't be pastors. Why not? Because of this passage in First Timothy. But it's a book that Paul didn't write. And And oddly enough, the person who wrote it very likely was a Gnostic Christian, not a mainstream Jewish Christian or even Gentile Christian of his day, but somebody who had kind of a radical view that sneaks that into the Bible. Well, you know, when when you claim to be somebody famous and you, you write your views and, and your views get accepted as that famous person, it completely changes how history remembers that person. And so uh, that's why Paul goes down in history today for among people with a more kind of liberated point of view, Paul's looked upon as having these kind of misogynistic tendencies. Uh, and it's not really fair to Paul because he didn't have these tendencies. It's simply because somebody later claiming to be Paul wrote this book, and then it got included in the New Testament. Uh, but it, it, again, I mean, there are uh, there are other examples of, of things that are, that are, it's sort of, it's like the one voice got louder. So the voice of Timothy gets louder uh, than other places that seem to contradict Timothy, 
And and that's part of what leads to great biblical debates and what leads to denominationalism, because one group will elevate one passage over the other passage. But the fact is, it got in there. And it somehow- got in there. And so what ended up happening is uh, people would read the rest of Paul's letters through the lens provided by this letter. And so if you have this very clear statement that women cannot speak in church and can exercise no authority over a man and cannot teach, uh, when you have that stated so clearly in 1 Timothy, then you think, well, that's what Paul thought. And so then you interpret the entire, all of Paul's other writings in light of that very clear statement. So Paul seems to be opposed to women, uh, but it's only because you're using this particular book, not written by Paul, as a way of interpreting the rest. You know, we see this to this day, and I'll mention an example I saw recently, and I know that you have others in the book Forged. Uh, but I, I, there was an interesting documentary about Ronald Reagan right around the time of his uh, the anniversaries that were being celebrated a little, uh, back in February, and and he there there are a lot of politicians today who invoke the name of Ronald Reagan when they're trying to uh, either gain popularity or try to get support for a particular idea, and in doing so claim that if Ronald Reagan were alive today, he would agree with me on X and X, or that I I am living the legacy of Ronald Reagan on the subject of Y. When you actually go back, and it's not that far, you don't have to go back but 25 years to go back and look at what Ronald Reagan actually said, and it would have been completely contradictory to what this person is claiming today, but nobody bothers to even go back and look at the source material. What would Reagan have thought? Because it's right there. Yeah, no, it's it's completely astounding, and you know it happens all the time in American history. I mean, they, you know, and the, the, where it happens even more, of course, is when you, when people talk about the founding fathers, and they come up with all sorts of claims about the founding fathers that are absolutely false. Uh, but it is striking that this this kind of activity can go on with somebody who is alive in our living memory. I mean, I was <laughs> I was very much alive and conscious of what Robert Reagan was doing, uh, right. and yet here people just, you know, just a couple of decades later can make these astounding claims. Uh, so it just shows that, in fact, you know, it's not, it's, it shouldn't be thought that odd that people were doing this back in biblical times as well. And they're, and they're naming the, the Ronald Reagans of their day. Um, yes. and. And using that as a way of of backing up their claims. So why is it so hard to say forged then? I mean, if if the evidence is so clear that, say, just again, to use from the Christian New Testament, First Timothy was not written by Paul, and yet the author makes claims that it was written by Paul, why can't why aren't we comfortable just saying forged? Well, it's. It's a good question, and I I wish I knew the answer. I, I think the I think the deal is that we're talking about the Bible here, which is which is sacred scripture for Christians, and so even scholars who who think that these books are pseudepigraphic uh, are you know more willing to say they're pseudepigraphic than saying that they're forged, and it's because the word forgery has such negative connotations, and there's a tradition within scholarship that that in the ancient world uh, this kind of activity didn't have negative connotations. And so what I try to show in my book is that that view is wrong. I try to show that in the ancient world, they also thought of uh, these, this kind of literary activity, where an author would claim to be someone famous, uh, that they called that lying, and they thought it was deceitful, and they didn't accept it. And so that's so I'm really in the book trying to make a case that uh, the word forged is the appropriate word, because for us it connotes deception and lying, and that's exactly what ancient people thought about it. And and at the risk of doing the same misrepresentation of Ronald Reagan that some people are doing, and doing this in the name of, of church fathers, I would make the claim, I don't know how you would, that if certain church fathers were alive today and they looked at what we codified as the Bible and what we consider to be uh, acceptable source material for uh, 
what was included in the Bible, they might also say forged. Some of them would. Maybe not all of them, but some of them would be willing they to go, would have. that was the, forged. The, the, uh, so the, the ancient authors who talk about this phenomenon, of course, they weren't speaking English, so they didn't use the word forged. They had two words that they used for this kind of book, and the church fathers used these two words. Uh, one word for a book that is written by somebody claiming to be a famous person when he's not, one word they use for that is the Greek word pseudos, which is the word that means lie. Uh, and so they called these books lies. The other book, the other word is is even more derogatory. The, they would call these books uh, notha. Well, the word nothos means bastard. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, an illegitimate child, a bastard. And so they called these books lies and bastards. So they didn't they didn't approve of these things, and they didn't uh, they you know they didn't look the other way. They actually called them what they thought they were, which was nasty things. And I don't think that we should shy away from calling them what they are either. Uh, well, and there are more than just books of the Bible at stake here too. I want to skip ahead to a later chapter in Forged uh, and talk about some influential books in modern history which were proposed to be real, which were forged, but that some people to this day don't realize are forged. And they still quote them as though they were real, or they still quote the material that was in them as real. And to me, that's as vivid and as recent as a hugely popular book and movie. More on that coming up next with Bart Ehrman, Forged is his new book, and as usual, it has a beautiful, very lush, very cool illustration on the cover, too. All of his books are well done. Uh, Whether you agree with them or not, worth reading. We'll get to what we should know about other forged material next on Coast to Coast.